welcome to my talk that is supporting Gemstone S64 alongside Farl for the Buenos Aires ecosystem. So what is this talk about? Uh, it's about the trip to add support for a new small dog implementation uh, for the BA small dog uh, ecosystem and the lessons that we learned on the road uh, when trying to support the new uh, implementation. So, but first, what's this Buenos Aires small dog thing? Uh, it's a collaboration space. We have uh, it in GitHub uh, for libraries and frameworks written in small dog. All the frameworks and libraries there are mid license, uh, and we use a good part of that tech stack in Mercap. Uh, it's composed for more than 30 open source projects, and every project has implemented good practices like uh, running continuity to test to it, uh, keeping a good, good level of code coverage, uh, paying attention to release management. When, when we broke uh, something, we released a major version and um, produced a migration guide. Uh, and it's space for collaboration. So if anyone wants to use uh, some of the libraries uh, or face an issue or collaborate, uh, it's open so you can uh, help us. And the other component uh, of this talk is Shemstone 64. Probably many people here at least uh, know something about Shemstone. And it's not so, it's a small implementation for a commercial vendor. That is, it's a bit different for the other implementations because uh, it includes uh, ACI transactions for the image. So the image is durable, persistent, and Multiple virtual machines can run against the same shared object memory. Uh, so it's not exactly the same as the usual small dots. Uh, and one of the advantages that includes Shepson 64 is that there is no in impedance mismatch between the objects that you program and the things that you want to persist. If you create an object inside a transaction and commit that transaction, that object get persisted. You don't have to write some mapping or glue code to transfer that to a relational database. Okay, we started uh, this uh, project to migrate some of the components to Shemtool 64 uh, as a project in Merkab because we have some complex business uh, model that is not trivial to persist in a relational database because it's a offshoot graph, very complex. And it looks like a good fit to persist it in Shemstone. And we say, okay, we should give it a try. We I need to try if this uh, would work for us. We have other products uh, working with another version for Shemstone. But for this uh, special case, we need to migrate some part of the tech stack. Uh, when we started in that migration uh, a few months ago, the current version of Shemstone was 3.6.6, but we know that the 3.7 were to be released in the meantime. Uh, so we already know when we started that we need to migrate from one version to another of Shemstone. And at the moment that we started, nor Smalltalk CI support, uh, nor the new IDE was uh, ready. Uh, so we, we have to do something with that also. Uh, and we have some goals because we already ported code between Faro, uh, VS plat bus platform, uh, and other versions of Shemstone. Uh, and from our previous experience, we know that we want single code base, that we need to that continually tested on all the platforms that we want to support. Because uh, going back and forth and migrating in point in time, uh, making a change that works in Faro, and learning later that this broke in another uh, small talk is just uh, unproductive. So uh, two of the goals we have with this pressure is we need a single code base and we want it continually tested on all the platforms that we support.
So even that we know, we knew that uh, major, the major version of GS64 was to be released in the middle of uh, the work, or the porting work. We need an easy way to try, think, uh, and test different versions. So the first thing that we did uh, was uh, to containerize Shepton 64. So we create uh, some unofficial Docker containers. Uh, we talked with the Shepton people and they were okay with doing that. If it's unofficial. Uh, so now they're here in GitHub, BST, Docker, Shemstone uh, 64. You can try easily in your machine in version of, of Shemstone 64 in the stone or remote Shems. Um, uh, even you can do something like a distributed system with several Shems in different containers. So it's easy for us to try new things. Uh, everybody has a reproducible environment. So if we, I want to try something in a, the machine of another people, they only need Docker install. I know how to install the version of Shellstone and dead dot and configure everything in every computer. Uh, and in these containers, we have a bit of uh, some to call, some scripts to load projects. I'm running a test, and I already mentioned that we want our code to be continually tested. So we, once we have the containers, we started the uh, and Smalltalk CI was not was not ready for this version of Shemstone. So we created a GitHub action that just runs in, a, in the same container and a bit of bash to build code, but you can. With these lines, you can test your own version in GitHub against the version on Shem264. In this case, it's loading the code of this project and running the test. So here I we move some version. So here, for example, I have a, a project with this integration enabled. Uh, and on every commit, on every pull request, the whole so, so the test suite is run. So here, if you go expand this step, right. this starts the uh, Shemstone server, it loads the code and run for the test suite. You can look at that. There are, I don't know, 50 lines of bash probably to make this work with all the GitHub infrastructure. So now we have an easy way to start a new uh, Shemstone version, try to ways to load code and ways to run the test in a continuous way. So we started porting with that uh, our projects. Uh, and we use as the lingua franca because we have the code already in Faro and in tunnel format as the interchange format. Uh, tunnel is supported in Shemstone by using row one that we will talk a bit in the next slide. Uh, and it's supported also in BAST. It's not uh, so native, but, but you can export or import code from Tonal. Uh, so for us, it, it's a it's a de facto interchange format because now three of the platforms support it, and it's very friendly to external version control systems. Okay, I mentioned row one. Row one is a new tool that comes with a new version of Shemstone 64. Uh, I will give a brief explanation. It's a new project package, map package manager. It replaces what Monticello, Mentacello does for Faro. Uh, and it integrates over the tunnel of or file tree format for the packages. But the, all the metadata that, metadata that now you put in the baseline, for example, in Faro, uh, it's just stone files in different parts of the repo. 
and, and it's a declarative uh, format. And this format has three components, but three parts. The components are something like groups of packages or another components. Projects are dependencies. They are called projects, but are your project dependency is not the project. And the load specs are a specification of loading targets, I would say. For example, we have in, in many of our projects in, in GitHub, we can load, I don't know, for deployments, don't load the test or don't load development tools. So we have, from the same project, we can say, okay, only load the deployment, the deployment target, and this loads part of the code. In row one, you do that with load specs. Uh, to give you a glimpse of how this looks, Okay, we have here uh, a repo that we oh, yeah. have. Okay. So in this source folder, the folder this, the, there is the call the call, the file packages in the format. And to use row one, you need to create a row one folder where you define components, projects, and specs. Components, as I said, are in the have a name, includes a number of packages. It can include or not another components, and it can include or not another projects as dependencies. In the end, it's a stone file with metadata, metadata nothing more fancy, similar with the projects. These are dependencies of these uh, specific projects. So you say, okay, <clears throat> the dependency is for this project. We clone it from here. This revision or commit or tag or whatever. And load these components <coughs> when, you load, when you load the project. And specs are similar to what you put in the projects, but for the same project, okay? Are different loading targets for this project. So this is just a glimpse. We, it's not so uh, obvious how to use row one. We talk a lot today when we started until we get for what is everything. But once you get the basics, converting your <clears throat> your way line is pretty easy. Okay, but it's not without uh, its quirks. Uh, the current is supported version of row one is version two. They is working on version three that fix some of these things. <clears throat> but the row one doesn't come without controversy. Uh, there are some general things that you need to take into account when row one is in the project or including support for Project 64. Uh, the first thing that you need to know is that the base library, the standard library of Shemstone is not still in row one format, so you cannot manage this code in row one. You have all this code compiled, but you cannot make changes using row one. Uh, for some reasons, classes still Class extensions need to be declared in the same symbol dictionary that includes the class definition. This is a difference with other small dots. Uh, but I think that the most uh, strange thing is the way that the project is loaded. Every other small dot implementation, when you load the project and this project has dependencies, usually it loads first completely a dependency, and once this is loaded, start loading the dependent packages. Uh, in row one, this is not the way it works. It just computes everything it had to load. So if I had a, a project, I don't know, Stargate that depends on Launchpad and depends on mm, project one. It takes all the code of all the projects, first compiles all the classes of all the projects, then all the methods, and then run all the initialization. So. 
it's a bit different and you cannot assume that the dependency is completely loaded and initialized when you are using it in another project. So it has, it, it, we have hit a bit of difficulty there. Um, and the last thing is, if you want to depend on parts of another project, uh, we have, for example, for the same project, maybe for a group, I say, okay, for deployment load from my, a dependency, but some subset, and from development other subset, this part is a bit tricky. I won't show it, but believe me, it's a bit tricky to do that in Rowan. Okay, now, what we learn, we are still working, uh, we have migrated, I think, that seven or eight projects and we still need to migrate uh, some more but we learned some lessons so if people want to use it maybe they can uh, use what we have already learned the first one and this is a lesson that we internalized a long time ago but it's always a good time to reinforce it again test it call automatically on every commit Try to have good coverage because I cannot imagine porting all this code without tests. Because the only way that I know that it works uh, partially is by running the test and looking at what broke and what is not working. Okay, uh, the first class of problems we hit were the easier to fix, I would say, because uh, they make a test fail with an error and you get a debugger in front of you as the, pro the problem usually is it's uh, easier. For example, in this case, the standard libraries are not the same in all the small talks and maybe they're using some method that is missing in the standard library of the other small talk. And it can be easily, the solution is really simple. It's just add the method as an, ext as an extension. The only thing that you have to take into account here is that if you're extending a base class that is already present in another package, the, tool, the way that row one manages extensions, you will need a new package because you will need to tell this method go to the symbol list that the original class is defined, not the symbol list for my project. But what? Well, this is the easy one case. Uh, another variation of this problem is when some class is missing. And here, when approach, no, when approach to fix this problem is just adding the missing classes if are things that are not present in that small dot. Uh, and sometimes this is easier to say than do because you say, oh, I need, an, uh, no, I don't have mutex. Okay, I will just, okay, I will take the mutex code, but mutex depends on other things that you end up moving more than one thing, but it's a, it's a way, it's an easy solution in the most cases. And in other cases, the classes already exist in implementation, but with another name. We hit this a lot with exceptions, for example. Uh, I remember, for example, in the collection of hierarchy, when you try to remove something and it's not present, if I you receive the file raises a not found error, and in Shenton it's called lookup error, but the semantic is the same. Uh, so in this case, with what we do is uh, you can, in row one, you can say, okay, I want to run some script before the code start loading. So we just alias the current class in the system with the name that was expected in the other system, and everything goes smooth from there. A more difficult case is when the method or the class you need exists in the standard library of linear implementation, but the semantics are slightly different. And what I found here is to use another method name. That's the approach that this took. Uh, but sometimes the existing method is almost that say, oh, I, this, this one, it's almost all I need, but we need a bit of flexibility. Uh, for example, the number of hierarchy usually uses double dispatch to resolve things. And a lot of other methods, if you introduce a bit of double dispatch, you can 
uh, use the same method name and cover your new case. So the problem here is that this code is not managed with row one. <clears throat> you cannot uh, use row one to update the code and you need a kind of preload script that compiles the new method that you want to change. And you need to be careful to not break the existing behavior. Okay, until now all, all the problems that I highlighted are have the same cause, and are different in the standard library, uh, but we hit another more subtle problems related to the way that row one loads the project. Uh, for example, in child 10, uh, we use some globals. At least I know we don't usually need to use globals, but we have globals for the months, so, so we can say January and get an instance of January. Um, and the problem is that the way that row one loads the code, uh, in Faro, this, uh, there are code that uh, references January and it's Compile as a reference, and later when this is initialized, it fixes and everything works. The same in BAST. But the way that Rowan wants to make the things, the initialization code is run after all the methods are compiled. And if the global does not exist before, the methods don't compile and Rowan don't work that way. So here we do some tricky stuff, like in the preload script, Say, okay, all these methods, yeah, I say something like, say, small to cut, my low, I put something, I don't know, doesn't matter. Later, it will get fixed. Uh, but we hit that, and it's not was uh, easier to fix. <clears throat> uh, and a more complex situation is when you are depending on some state of something initialized <clears throat> by other projects. Uh, take for example, suppose you are using Grease. Grease has, has something that's called the Grease platform. <coughs> it's a, that is some kind of singleton. But this singleton is initially when the initial code is run, not when the methods are compiled. So if you have a project that depends on Grease and you want in the initialization code of something in the other project to use Grease platform current, do something, this won't work because it's not initialized yet. <clears throat> the initialization of row one, of initialization methods are called in row one not in a deterministic way. It's not the dependency first. It's, these are ordered initialization methods. Uh, start with the superclasses, but later it's semi random the, the order. <clears throat> so here, uh, you have. And at least we found two solutions. What is make that lazy? So it would get, get initialized when someone wants it. And the other one was to move some initialization code that depends on the other uh, to a post load script that we get run after all the codes compiled and all the initialization methods uh, are executed. The at last some general advice to this code portability. Uh, avoid pulling dictionaries. They are different in all the small implementations I know. Really different. Uh, and usually I don't know if we need pull dictionaries in the language. Maybe a use case, but generally we can avoid it. And the other one is that, that there are some parts that are non portable. Like networking, it's different. Nearly one and process scheduling is different. The way to fork processes is not the same. So here you need to introduce some kind of indirection uh, and put some object in the middle that you say instead of say to a block fork, say to something fork this block for me a type priority and you will need implementations for every platform. Yeah. The same with operation to operating system services. This is another area that in general are not compatible. And that's all. Thank you. Do you have any questions? My impression from what you said is that the moment Rowan starts behaving like all other package, package managers that import in the order of the dependency, most of those problems you pointed 
go away on my right on this? Uh, I don't know if we, we go away. They will be the same problems that we had with another tools. But row one will but take care of them. The initialization, of... the initialization part, I think that it's the more uh, strange because you expect that if I have a project that in, in isolation it works, uh, I will expect that it would it shouldn't break when I use it as a dependency to other projects. And this can happen. Uh, we hit that problem because we have a project that in isolation work all the spaces and we include it as dependency to another because we are using something that is not still initialized, it wouldn't work. Did it, did that uh, uh, project uh, end up with a better design or was it just uh, modifying it or the purpose of Which compatibility? Uh, with some preload and postload scripts, you can keep the code the same and just circumvent the row one things.